Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Dr. Helen Caldicott for specific information on her upcoming symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. Dr. Caldicott shares much about her concerns, her reason for calling a symposium on nuclear weapons at this time, and includes an awareness we all need to have about the nuclear dangers of artificial intelligence. Plus, the ever-popular features, numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, some surprising news for John Stewart and The Daily Show, and more nuclear information than CNN covered all last month and the month before that, and so on and so on. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 3rd, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Over in Japan, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Japan's nuclear regulator has approved a plan by TEPCO to drain still radioactive wastewater from the firm's crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster area into the sea, yes, the Pacific Ocean. With the wave of a magic pencil, these regulators have approved the controversial plan and say TEPCO officials can flush this water into the ocean. Local fishermen know better. They say, we can't trust TEPCO. If they proceed with their plan, the situation will surely go back to how it was before. I'm worried that the government and TEPCO will act to suit themselves. Yeah, think? One of the problems is that the waste management system, known in English as ALPS, is designed to remove most of the remaining radioactive contaminants. So let's define most. According to TEPCO, they can reduce 62 nuclides below the density limit. Now, remember, that's not the same as zero. That's just the limit as placed by the industry and the government, which are pretty much in cahoots with each other. Even the Japan Atomic Energy Agency admits that they did detailed calculations for 1,200 radionuclides. That's a lot more than 62. Dr. Gordon Edwards, co-founder of Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibilities and a court-certified nuclear expert, stated, the water can't be dumped into the ocean. It's completely unsafe because of these fission products. It's impossible for them, meaning TEPCO or the Japanese government, to remove all those hundreds of radioactive materials. They know how to remove about 62 of them, but there's other ones that they cannot. TEPCO has been storing the contaminated water in about 1,000 tanks on site, but they're reluctant to release it into the ocean. Why? Not because it's the wrong thing to do or it will contaminate the ocean. For thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. No. TEPCO has been reluctant to release the contaminated water because they want to avoid adding to tensions with local communities and criticism from neighboring countries and some nations with a Pacific Ocean coastline. Gee. I wonder why they might object. Oh, that's right. I live on the west coast of the United States, and I object. But the problem, from the Japanese perspective, 
is that TEPCO is close to running out of space to build new tanks at the facility. They'll admit that there is tritium in the water, no mention of other possible radionuclides, of which there are, as we heard, hundreds, if not more than a thousand. And the PR propagandist spin is that tritium is considered one of the least harmful radioactive materials at nuclear plants. Well, yeah, if you compare it to plutonium. Doesn't mean it's harmless. There's no such thing as a harmless dose of radiation. And, of course, there is no detailed study about tritium's long-time effect on animal genes. And, by the way, human beings are animals. So this is personal. TEPCO also admits that it's two months behind on their schedule for cleaning the tainted water. And more keeps appearing every day, as between 300,000 and 400,000 gallons of water go through the basement of the building, have contact with God only knows what, and comes out the other side, tainted, their word, with radionuclides. Kind of like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, only there ain't no wizard to stop this flow. And then there's this curious item from Japan Times that TEPCO says it probably will not meet its target of completing by the end of March the first section of the frozen soil shields, in other words, the ice wall, to curb the buildup of radioactive water at the Fukushima nuclear disaster site. Uh, guys, I thought the ice wall was determined as being totally ineffective and abandoned sometime late in 2014. Is there an ice wall, or is there not an ice wall? Or is the attempt at an ice wall still being attempted? If anybody listening can clarify this for me, I would really appreciate it. Japanese officials now admit that the nuclear fuel continued melting long after seawater was injected into the Fukushima reactors. And at this point, only some of Fukushima's melted fuel is now solid. Nuclear disaster, the gift that keeps on giving. Meanwhile, 43 million tons of radioactive waste is contained in 43 million fabric sacks weighing one ton each. This is all left over from the so-called decontamination process. The Japanese government intends to incinerate all this waste in incinerators to be constructed in each municipality of Fukushima. Yeah, that's right. Let's try burning this stuff up, releasing radionuclides into the air with the smoke, leaving it in the ash to be dumped into Tokyo Bay. The fabric sacks that all of this waste is stored in are designed to last up to five years outdoors. Well, we're coming up on the fourth anniversary of Fukushima this March, so some of these sacks are bound to fail in a year's time. That raises the question, how long will it take to incinerate, bad idea to begin with, but it looks like they're going to do it anyway, how long will it take to incinerate 43 million tons of radioactive waste at 7 tons a day per incinerator? Well, activist Deun Renard of Rainbow Warriors crunched the numbers for us. 43 million tons divided by 59 incinerators divided by 7 tons per day divided by 365 days in a year, not counting leap year, equals 285 years to incinerate the 43 million tons of radioactive waste accumulated to date. All of which goes to creating context for this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of the week. Ah, pity the poor ambassadors. Because when it comes to keeping up appearances on behalf of their countries, they have no choice. Even when it comes to possibly ingesting radionuclides. In Japan last week, ambassadors of four Commonwealth nations, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Britain attended a government event in Tokyo to support food from the disaster-stricken Fukushima prefecture. They were served 
and chowed down on rice balls and other tasty morsels based on foods that were grown in that radiologically contaminated prefecture. The January 27 event was organized by the Farm Ministry in an effort to promote exports of Fukushima goods, which have remained stagnant since the nuclear accident triggered by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, which are the only causes mentioned in the article. They very clearly avoid mention of all things radiological. The envoys were served onigiri rice balls made from grain harvested in the prefecture, beef from cows raised nearby, and washed everything down with Fukushima-produced Ginjo Premium Sake. Mm-mm-mm. Nothing like a little alcohol to help you forget what it is you're actually eating. Now, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada had lifted import restrictions on products from Fukushima Prefecture by January of 2014. And Britain allows imports as long as a government-issued radioactive material inspection certificate is submitted. There's nothing here about which government does the inspecting and what the standards are for inspection, but it's probably the 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram, which is legal in Japan but used to be considered radioactive waste. However... Agricultural products produced in Fukushima Prefecture are still widely shunned in overseas markets. Twelve nations and regions, including Fukushima Prefecture's former key export destinations of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, still fully or partially ban imports of foods from the prefecture. Of course, here in the United States, we not only don't ban it, we accept food that is 12 times more contaminated than the food that is allowed in Japan. Their limit is 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram of food. Here in the U.S., it's 1,200. And U.S. manufacturers don't have to list where their food stuff comes from. So it could be mixed in with any manufactured products, and probably is already. As for those four extremely loyal to their country ambassadors... After their mm -mm good Fukushima-based snacks, let's hope that they signed up for an epidemiological study. Three to five years for thyroid cancer or leukemia to show up, 12 to 15 years for hard tumors, and it goes on after that. Let's track these guys and find out what happens to them after consuming this food. And that's why Farm Ministry of Japan, oh, you who produced this event, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Tetsu Kariya, author of the gourmet manga Oishinbo, says in the series' latest edition that radiation is so high in Fukushima Prefecture it is causing nosebleeds among local residents. The theme echoes one in a previous story that critics panned when Kariya had the main character suffer a nosebleed after visiting the radioactive remains of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The controversial episodes ran in Big Comic Spirits magazine last May and was covered on Nuclear Hot Seat. But when the manga was compiled into book form, critical passages, including one linking nosebleeds and radiation exposure, were watered down. In his latest book, Kariya questions the Environment Ministry's assertion that radiation is unlikely to be causing nosebleeds locally. He cites surveys that found that many people have been suffering nosebleeds in the prefecture. In the final chapter, Kariya emphasizes that the reconstruction of the lives of people is far more important than the recovery of the land of Fukushima. He says, It is only you who can protect yourselves. Please have the courage to flee from Fukushima. In Ushiku City in Ibaraki Prefecture, 261 kilometers or 162 miles away from Fukushima, 48 of 89 children who had their thyroids tested were given a diagnosis of A2 or B. A diagnosis of A2 is given when a thyroid nodule is found but it's smaller than 5 millimeters, or a cyst is found that is smaller than 20 millimeters. Once they are larger than that, a diagnosis of B is given, both for the nodules 
and the cysts, meaning only less than half of those tested turned out to be free of any abnormality. Meanwhile, the Ushiku city government states that 40 children with diagnosis of A2 don't need any follow-up inspection. Yeah, right. And if it was your kid? Bridging over from Japan to the U.S., Japan and U.S. government experts now admit that the West Coast was hit by radioactive plumes from both massive Fukushima explosions. The plume released from Fukushima was shown to have increased air concentration of radionuclides in Sacramento, California, Melbourne, Florida, Sandpoint, Alaska, and Oahu, Hawaii. The dates these hit were anywhere from March 18th to March 22 of 2011. Ironically, the name of the program that has just recently provided this data is the worldwide version of System for Prediction of Environmental Emergency Dose Information, the acronym for which is SPEEDY. Considering it took almost four years, that's not very speedy at all. Good news for Californians. Our state attorney general, Kamala Harris, has started an investigation into the California Public Utilities Commission's $3.3 billion bailout of San Onofre on behalf of Southern California Edison. State investigators seized computers and other items from the homes of former California Public Utilities Commission President Michael Peavy and former PG&E Vice President Brian Cherry, who is at the heart of a judge-shopping controversy that has embroiled the regulatory agency for months. Thanks but no thanks to the CPUC, ratepayers in San Diego County and Southern California are covering that $3.3 billion out of $4.7 billion in shutdown costs as a result of faulty steam generations that leaked in 2012 and prompted San Onofre to be closed for good in 2013. Last summer, Emails released under the California Public Records Act appeared to show Peavy maintained unusually close ties to executives from companies he was in charge of regulating. How J.W. Burns of him. Peavy regularly traded emails and accepted private meeting invitations from Edison executives and other utility officials and acceded to requests they made to him privately. One called him such a dear and a great friend. Oh, by the way, Michael Peavy worked as president of Southern California Edison before he was named president of the California Public Utilities Commission in 2002. And in a particularly egregious email exchange in April of 2011, Peavy congratulated PG&E executives for how the company handled publicity regarding a license renewal for the controversial Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in San Luis Obispo. Children, can you say conflict of interest? Sick him, Kamala. Here are some reactor updates. The Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, Massachusetts, shut down during the winter storm on Tuesday, January 27, when the electrical connections it uses to transmit electricity to the grid were interrupted. Well, cool off, Pilgrim. Prior to the week's massive storm, several area watchdog groups called on federal regulators to shut down the Pilgrim nuclear power station during the event. Diane Turco co-founder of the nuclear watchdog group Cape Downwinders, said she was relieved that circumstances forced the shutdown. Referring to shortcomings at the facility cited by the NRC inspectors in a report released on Monday, January 26, Turco called emergencies at the plant predictable. She said, instead of telling them to try again, the NRC should be saying, you're not meeting standards, and we're shutting you down. If there had been an emergency at the plant this week, there could have been no evacuation. The situation would have been the perfect storm. Oh, well, good luck, Pilgrim. Yes, 
Good luck to us all. Construction of the two-reactor Vogel plant in Georgia has been set back 18 months at a cost of over $700 million. The Georgia site has seen delays on the construction of the reactors that have left it embroiled in lawsuits with the two primary contractors. Given that competing sources of electricity, including natural gas and renewables, can be deployed far more rapidly and with well-established costs, it appears that the U.S. nuclear industry is likely to suffer an extended decline. This, according to the Associated Press. And our movement's eminence grise, Carl Grossman, wrote a compelling article on the dangers of once-through cooling from Millstone Nuclear Power Plant in Connecticut. He cited the massive amounts of water sucked in from the Long Island Sound by the Millstone plants. Two billion gallons of water moving in and then being discharged daily. That's three times the volume of the water going over Niagara Falls every day. And it comes out 20 degrees warmer than when it was taken in. Many species of marine life have been declining in abundance in the Sound over the past two decades. And the situation at Millstone is not unique. In Vermont, the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant has just been closed because of the issue of warm water discharge into the Connecticut River damaging marine life. It's called thermal pollution. Thermal pollution and its impact on the Hudson River is a key issue in the ongoing battle regarding Entergy's two Indian Point nuclear power facilities just north of New York City. Internationally, in a truly Pyrrhic victory, the government of Fiji has announced the commencement of a process to disperse a one-off payment to veterans of the Christmas Island's nuclear test known as Operation Grapple. The payment would be for medical assistance in recognition of the various ailments the veterans had suffered over the years since the test took place between 1956 and 1958. Payments would be to the surviving veterans, followed by direct dependents. And how much would this munificent payment be? In United States dollars, $4,788 each. Wow! Could you spare it? Then again, the British government, which exploded the bombs, has refused to pay any compensation. And veterans are known to have suffered ailments, including leukemia and other blood disorders. And we're going to be putting three links to longer articles up on the website. The first is from Greenpeace, and it's on an American Chernobyl, nuclear near misses at U.S. reactors since 1986. Some light bedtime reading. An article entitled, Dumping Radioactive Food from Japan on the World, Why the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a Pending Disaster. And an Australian article on the nuclear wars waged against First Nations people will also be linked on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 189. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, good news. My ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is in the process of being turned into a book book. That's right, one of those physical things you hold in your hand that's made out of paper and smells good and has heft and weight and belongs on the shelf in a library. If you wish to purchase a copy of the ebook, that would certainly be welcome. And hopefully in the next few weeks, you'll be hearing how you can purchase a copy of the physical book. This is a real milestone for me, and I'm very excited to be getting it out into your hands. Details soon to follow. This week, I had both the honor and the pleasure of again interviewing Dr. Helen Caldicott. She is a pediatrician who has become one of the, if not the, leading anti-nuclear activist and author in the world. For more than five decades, she has led the fight against all aspects of the nuclear issue. She is the co-founder of Physicians for Social Responsibility, a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize, and the 2003 winner of the Lannan Prize for Cultural Freedom. Her books include The New Nuclear Danger, War in Heaven, 
Nuclear power is not the answer and loving this planet. In 2013, she produced the extraordinary two-day international symposium, The Medical and Ecological Impact of Fukushima, which resulted in another book, Crisis Without End. Now she is again producing a symposium, this time on nuclear weapons and allied issues. It's called Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction. Dr. Caldicott is not one to shy away from a tough title or the even tougher information. Give a listen. Dr. Helen Caldicott, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. What led to your decision to produce a second symposium, this time on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction? The reason is that I read an article in the Atlantic Monthly some months ago quoting Stephen Hawking, the eminent physicist, and Max Tegmark, also a physicist, talking about their fears and concerns that within 10 or 20 years, computers will have taken over almost all functions that human beings actually now perform, but also they, they'll probably become autonomous, they'll be able to reproduce themselves, but more than that, they're worried that the computers themselves could start a nuclear war. So that was my initial stimulus. That's a pretty stunning set of thoughts. For those of us who lived through the Cold War and through the tensions of the nuclear age, it is astonishing to realize that Russia and the U.S. are again approaching loggerheads with each other and that the battleground could be nuclear. You're saying that even separate from the human factor in this, it could be the machines themselves that decide to trigger a nuclear war. That's correct, Libby, but that question is against the background of everything else that is now happening. The Ukrainian situation is very tense, very volatile. The Americans set up that coup in the Ukraine um, against Yanukovych, who was the former president, and they funded this change of government and the coup to the tune of $5 billion. They're now arming the Ukrainians, many of whom are former Nazis. The people in the east of the Ukraine are, are Russians. They what, don't want to change anything. Um, and they're called separatists, but they're not. They're residents of the Ukraine trying to maintain their normal lifestyle, and they're being bombed and blasted with missiles and stuff. Now, because... It now pits Russia and America against each other. Militarily, Putin has raised his nuclear missiles to a higher state than normal of alert. And presumably, if he has, America has too. So the Cold War never ended, Libby, um, although we thought it had. The Russian and American bombs were never disarmed and taken away. 93% of the 16,000 or so nuclear weapons today in the world are owned by Russia and America. It's only Russia and America that can destroy life on the planet. And we're entering a very, very dangerous stage where the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and NPR are not talking about this. They're blaming Putin. It's not Putin that set the thing up. It's the neocons in the State Department, Victoria Newland, and others I have no idea why they're doing this, but it's so dangerous. And on top of that, Obama's just said that he would allow $1 trillion to be spent in the next 30 years replacing every single nuclear warhead, missile, ship, plane, and the like. We've got a very hawkish Senate, and the Armed Services Committee now is run by Senator John McCain, who's never seen a war he didn't like or wanted to get into. Look, we're in a very, very, very dangerous position, and the public is almost totally ignorant, which is why I set up the symposium. Put this into perspective. What would be the medical and environmental consequences of either a small, limited, or a large-scale nuclear war? Okay, well, uh, studies have been done by a wonderful meteorologist called Alan Robock at Rutgers, and he will be speaking if there's a small nuclear war between India and Pakistan using only a 100 nuclear weapons the size of Hiroshima, which was tiny compared to present-day arsenals, there would be such a huge cloud of black radioactive smoke from all the burning cities and the oil refineries and the rubber and the whole thing. 
injected into the stratosphere so it would cool the temperatures of the earth down considerably so that crops would fail for many years and over a billion people would starve. Now, that's called nuclear autumn, and that's only a 100 weapons. Now, America and Russia have over a 1,000 hydrogen bombs targeted on each other on hair trigger alert, ready to go with a press of the button by Putin or, or Obama. Obama always is accompanied by an officer carrying a suitcase called the football, which is, uh, contains the codes to start and initiate a nuclear war. Same with Putin. Um, when Obama met with the Pope recently, the football was under the table to destroy God's creation, if you please. And the weapons only take 30 minutes to go from launch to land. And in that interim, as they're traveling through space, the other country's satellite or radio picks up the attack. They've pressed their button and it's all over in about an hour. Every town and city with a population of 50,000 or more probably is targeted in the U.S. There are 10 hydrogen bombs, huge things. Russian bombs are big. 10 hydrogen bombs targeted on New York City alone, two for each airport. One for each bridge. Um, there's such a redundancy of weapons. There are probably 60 targeted on Washington and maybe on Moscow. And it's not just America that's targeted and all the universities and industries and the like. But since the Cold War, America has thought it fit to target China as well. England, Europe, Canada, uh, Australia, Japan, they're all targeted. So if this happened, and it could happen tonight, I have to tell you, then by accident, by design, by human error, and that's what the symposium will be about fundamentally. As all the cities burn ferociously, absolutely ferociously, such a cloud of toxic black smoke will be injected into the stratosphere from all over the world that it will literally block out the sun for up to 10 years, creating what's called nuclear winter and a short ice age and everything and everyone will freeze to death in the dark. The ultraviolet light will be so intense that if you stayed outside for five minutes, if indeed you survive, which you wouldn't, you'll be blinded because the ozone will be totally destroyed. The fallout will be so intense that, well, they say if you are in a fallout shelter, but if you're in a fallout shelter, the fires will suck out all the oxygen in the shelter and you'll be asphyxiated. However, if you did survive, you can't come out for six months because the radiation will be so intense. What about food? Well, they said they'd send out the old people to collect food because they won't live long enough, enough to get their cancers. And on and on. I can keep going, Libby, if you want. It's just almost unbelievable, but it, it's true. This brings back all of the existential angst that I remember growing up in the middle of through the 1950s when we were so aware of Russia being a threat to us and the bomb being an ultimate threat to us all. How and why do you think our awareness has slipped to the point where modern generations, the younger generations, have no real awareness of what a nuclear bomb explosion could mean? Well... Several reasons. When the Cold War ended, I and most other people thought, thank God it's over, and we collapsed on our couches. We were so tired and exhausted trying to, you know, bring the Cold War to an end. And we assumed, stupidly, that the politicians would get rid of the nuclear weapons very fast. Well, George Walker Bush, he actually got rid of some of the nuclear weapons in Europe to help Gorbachev so Gorbachev could rid the nuclear weapons from the Eastern Bloc countries into Moscow so they would be secure and no one could start a nuclear war. Then Clinton got in. Clinton had no guts. And he'd never been to Vietnam, so, you know, he wasn't a soldier. He hadn't killed anyone. And he, he didn't stand up to the Pentagon, and he left all the weapons in place. He could, though, if it had any courage and a spine to speak of, written out an agreement and flown an Air Force One over to see Boris Yeltsin, who was a hardened alcoholic and totally compliant with America at the time. And he could have said, Boris, sign here. We're going to abolish nuclear weapons as fast as we can. And Boris would have signed. But Clinton was, I think, intimidated by the Pentagon and he left all these weapons in place. And now Obama wants to upgrade them all and replace them all for Christ's sake. And... If we have a nuclear war tonight, it's all on Clinton's shoulders, I have to tell you. And, you know, I worked so hard 
during the nuclear weapons freeze, kind of helping to lead that really second American revolution against nuclear war. Um, and, you know, <laughs> one man can determine the fate of the earth. And uh, I would say that's Clinton. And now all the gloves are off and Russia's saying she'll upgrade all her nuclear arsenal. God help us, you know. And the nuclear power industry is selling nuclear power reactors all over the world, which are bomb factories because each of them make 500 pounds of plutonium a year and you only need 10 pounds to make a bomb. And plutonium lasts for half a million years. So, you know, you might have a stable government now that you sell a nuclear power plant to, but in 20 years you might get a raging dictator or a madman or woman who would start building bombs. So what America is doing and other countries is producing lateral proliferation of nuclear weapons, which destabilizes the so-called balance of terror between Russia and America. And, you know, on 9-11, when no one knew what the hell was going on, the Air Force, STRATCOM, put your missiles on the highest state of nuclear war alert. It went from DEFCON 5, 4, 3, 2. And one is press the button because no one knew what was happening. You see, human fallibility, human anxiety. In the last year, there have been stories of U.S. nuclear launch personnel in the missile silos cheating on tests by texting each other answers and also nuclear launch technology being based on computers so old that their floppy disks are literally floppy disks. How does this aging technology, how does the clear lack of honorable, skilled, reliable, and tested personnel impact our nuclear weapons safety? Well, it's terrifying. You see, the officers in the missile silos, there are two of them aged about 18 to 22, each armed with a pistol, one to shoot the other if one shows signs of deviant behavior. So I guess the deviant one could shoot the normal one. In fact, they've worked out a method whereby one man can turn both locks, even though they're 12 feet apart, by tying a string on a key and turning both locks. Often the telephones don't work. You're right, they use floppy disks. They go to sleep on the job. They take drugs before they go down there because being in a missile silo isn't very sexy for the Air Force. You don't get promoted and get stars and stripes and ribbons on your chest by sitting there waiting to blow up the world. It's boring as anything. And I've met some of the girlfriends of these blokes and they, some of them take drugs before they go down to do their jobs. Now, if that's bad, can you imagine what the Russians are, are up to? You know, we have no idea, but you'd have to assume that their people are also terribly, they're not up to scratch. I read in the 80s that the many of the people in the Russian military are such alcoholics they drink the antifreeze out of their tanks, you know. So we're in a very, very deleterious, precipitous position, and no one knows about it. It's like we're all practicing psychic numbing, walking like lemmings towards the nuclear cliff of annihilation. In fact, it's the media that are determining the fate of the Earth. They've been quite wicked in America. The New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR, CNN, Fox, of course are blaming Putin for the current situation in the Ukraine. And in fact, it's the State Department and the neocons in America who fostered the coup that got rid of Yanukovych and put in a puppet in the Ukraine. I can't remember his name now, Poroshenko. And there are a lot of ex-Nazis working with the Americans and Poroshenko. The people in the east of Ukraine are Russians, and they are called separatists and some other derogatory term they're not. They just want to maintain their standard of living and live as they've always have. So what America is obviously doing, they've put a puppet into government in the Ukraine, provoking Putin, like sticking needles into him. Now, I think he's probably a bit paranoid, I'm not sure, but, you know, in medicine you don't provoke a paranoid patient or they're likely to do something really awful. In fact, maybe even kill you. So... <laughs> I, I can't understand the American media, but I do know that the New York Times promoted the invasion of George W. Bush into Iraq by publishing five front-page articles by Judith Miller saying that uh, Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and that was a lie. They conceded later that they shouldn't have done that, but they're partly responsible for the death of over a million people in Iraq. The media, if they don't tell the truth 
and they go down the propaganda line as mouthpieces for neocons and really crazy people. I mean, <laughs> people don't know. People don't know. And without knowing, then people can't act. And as President Jefferson once said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion, and I'm afraid this democracy in America, if indeed it is a democracy, is totally uninformed about this horrific situation. Yet if you think there was a case of rabies in New York, that would be front-page headlines throughout the country. In the materials for the symposium, you talk about assessing the situation, the nuclear situation, from an anthropological perspective. What do you mean by that? Well, what causes men to kill? <laughs> My next book's going to be called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them. Um, what is this killing instinct? And if it's not abated and we don't put a stop to this psychological aberration that we have, we're going to destroy ourselves. I once asked Carl Sagan, who was quite a close friend of mine, if he thought there was any other life in the universe. And he paused for quite a long time. And then he said, no. And I said, why? And he said, because if any species had reached our stage of development, they would have destroyed themselves. The guys that rise to the top are often sociopaths. They're brilliant, charming, strategic, with no moral conscience. And I would say that, you know, a lot of people in the Pentagon and certainly in Boeing and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon would be the same. And so we allow people who are deranged, and I really mean that, to determine our fate and the fate of our children. Meanwhile, we all sit back, you know, eating our Pringles while watching Fox television, and our children, the truth is, they really don't have a future. And I speak as a paediatrician now, having taken the Hippocratic Oath and concerned for all the children of the world, their future, and their children and generations hence. This leads directly into a word that is used repeatedly in the materials for the symposium, and that is pathology, that you talk about the pathology of the military-industrial complex, and pathology is defined as the science or study of the origin, nature, and course of diseases. And, of course, pathological refers to the compulsive, the obsessive, the hardened, the confirmed. To your mind... What makes nuclear pathological? Well, it's obvious, Libby, really. That's quite a silly question in a way, because <laughs> it will destroy life on Earth. You know, men could fight and kill until we develop nuclear weapons. And it was Einstein who said the splitting of the atom changed everything, everything, all reality, save man, and I stress man, man's mode of thinking. Thus, we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. That's it, in a nutshell. Men still think the same way that they can go out and kill each other and kill civilians and children and women. I mean, it's just obscene. I've spent my life trying to save lives as a doctor. How anyone can kill anyone else is absolutely beyond imagination for me. And unless we stop this mad instinct that is really upmost in many men's minds, I think, you know, the reptilian midbrain, just operates as it always has we're doomed Libby and unless the women rise up and the women we're really pathetic we are we stand back and let the men run the show and it's time we took over I mean they've had their chance and now we need to smack their bottoms and, and say stand aside we're taking over for our children's future so you see an uprising of women as the best possible way to cure or at least derail this pathological obsession with and commitment to nuclear? Yeah, I think so, partly because 52% of the world's population are women. We have all the babies and we don't use our power. You know, so often I'll give a talk and everyone will come crowding around me and a man will say something and I'll say, look, that's a great idea. Why, why don't you run for Congress? And he says, sticks his chest out and says, yeah. And a woman will come up with a similarly good idea, and I'll say the same thing to her. And she said, who, me? And she literally steps back three paces. <laughs> so I don't know if we're going to have the passion like Joan of Arc or La Passionara in Spain to rise up and say, okay, enough's enough. This is not going to keep going. You've got to stop killing. You've got to stop killing or we'll blow up the planet. Changing focus just a little bit. On Saturday night, at the symposium, February 28th, 
There will be a screening of Stanley Kramer's 1959 film, On the Beach. What is your history with the film? Well, uh, my history with that is very profound. I actually read the book first, On the Beach, by an Australian author called Neville Shute. And it's about a nuclear war that occurs in the Northern Hemisphere by accident and everyone dies and the only people left alive in the world are people in Melbourne because it's so far south in Australia. And it describes the last days of the people in Melbourne and gentlemen were having their last gin and tonic at the Melbourne club and how the government dispensed cyanide capsules so that parents could kill their babies immediately and wouldn't have to die of the horrific effects of radiation illness with their hair falling out, vomiting and bleeding to death. And at the end of that book, the beautiful, elegant streets of Melbourne were still there. And this is in Stanley Kramer's film. And St George was slaying the dragon outside of the wonderful Melbourne Public Library. And a blind was gently flapping. And that was the end of life on earth. And that image branded my soul. And when Stanley Kramer made the film I saw a couple of years later, it was as profound then as when I read the book. And then I started first year medicine at the age of 17 and learnt about radiation and mutations and cancer and I couldn't understand why Russia and America were blowing up bombs in the atmosphere, large numbers in the northern hemisphere polluting millions of people with radioactive fallout and how many cancers would be occurring and mutations and genetic diseases and I've been in that mode ever since, I could never understand, so that film really got to me and the reason I'm playing it at this conference is Libby, we can talk till the cows come home, facts, figures you know, psychology all very left brain but unless it gets right into the pit of our stomach or gut what it really feels like really feels like to face the end of life on earth from a personal perspective It doesn't really change anything. And what I'm hoping to do is with the scientists who are speaking, and I've got some of the best speakers and scientists in the world at this conference, and the people who come, that they will be so shocked that it will change their lives and that they will decide to do something about it. Is there anything that you would like to add? No, only that... As Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion and it's your responsibility, I'm talking to everyone now in the audience, as you live in a democracy to become absolutely totally informed about this issue. So I would invite you to go to my webpage, HelenCaldicottFoundation.org, check out the symposium, read as many articles as you can on the profound consequences of nuclear war and how it could happen and the Ukrainian situation, the like and the like and come to the conference. It will be live streamed, but there's nothing like being there. It's being held in the New York Academy of Medicine, beautiful marble building with huge, sort of laden with the history of medicine. And it will be, I think, a a situation that may, in fact, change your life forever. So I'd love to see you there. Well, you will be seeing me there because I'll be attending and interviewing people on behalf of Nuclear Hot Seat. Dr. Caldicott, I want to thank you for everything, for all you've been doing. I often refer to you as the goddess Athena for your ferocity and your your (laughs) steadfastness in the work that you have done. And I look forward to greeting you personally and participating and sharing word of this important event with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much, Libby. I look forward to seeing you, too. That was Dr. Helen Caldicott talking about her upcoming symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. We will have a link up to where you can sign up for that symposium and learn more about it on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 189. Speaking of that symposium, I will be attending thanks to the generosity of some listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat. But I do not yet have the resources to cover many of the expenses connected with this trip. If you would like to help me help you get the cutting-edge information, not just what will be shown on live stream, but individual interviews with many of the participants, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com on the homepage, scroll down, and click on the big red Donate button. 
whatever you can do to help, know that it's appreciated, and it will go a long way towards helping me get the information to you that you deserve and that you certainly will not be getting from mainstream media. Whatever you can do to support, you have my appreciation and my gratitude. Dr. Caldecott spoke movingly of the impact of the movie On the Beach and what it did to set her on the course that she has followed ever since in her life. Last week, at a speaking engagement I did as part of the Great Minds series of Eileen Proctor here in Los Angeles, one of the attendees was Karen Kramer, widow of the late Stanley Kramer, who produced the movie. Mrs. Kramer spoke movingly about having met Dr. Caldecott, and Myla Reason, a no-nukes activist, caught her talk on video. We will be having a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 189, if you want to see how a member of Hollywood royalty responded to one of our leading lights. Hey, John Stewart, guess what? I'm going to the Daily Show. Now, I'm not yet expecting a red carpet from you. What I've got are tickets to be able to stand in line for your March 2nd show, right after the symposium in New York. And, of course, I have every intention of snagging a seat, if not a face-to-face with you. Proximity is power, booby, and this is the first time I will be on your show. All right, perhaps it was just going to be me whooping in the background with the rest of the audience, but I'm not yet done with you. And I will succeed in becoming your nuclear pundit. Yes, yours, John Stewart. I just thought you should know that I'm going to be there in case you want to speed up the process. Activist shout out. We're turning back to no nukes activist Myla Reason. She has something to tell us about an important action that can possibly result in shutting down Pacific Gas and Electric's decrepit Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. Myla wrote to me. Within the next few weeks, the staff of the California Water Resources Control Board is expected to issue recommendations requiring PG&E to bring Diablo Canyon into compliance with California's landmark policy to protect the marine environment. It's called California's once-through cooling policy. Side note from me, we referenced once-through cooling in the story about Millstone in Connecticut. Back to Myla. A 30-day comment period will begin as soon as the staff recommendations are issued, and it is critically important that as many people as possible weigh in during that 30-day period. Expect petitions and letter-writing campaigns to be announced. For updates, you can check at nonukesca.net. And no, you do not have to be from or living in California to comment. After all, California has a big tourist industry and our beautiful coast, and its fisheries are a big tourist draw. So no matter where you are, you can write as someone who visits the state. Or someone who loves the seals, sea lions, and turtles that are needlessly being harmed and killed by destructive antiquated once-through cooling technology at Diablo Canyon. And as the saying goes, as California goes, so goes the nation. She concludes, I'm not sure if the saying is predictive of what may follow at other nuke plants that use once-through cooling, but I do believe that spirits will be lifted when we get Diablo Canyon shut down. Thanks for the heads up, Mila. Here's today's final thought. Dan Rudka is a former nuclear energy worker who lives in Port Hope, Ontario, Canada. He worked for one of the nuclear industries, Zerkatech, which would become Cameco, which is an enormous nuclear energy supplier in Canada. Dan has now been ill for 20 years with an extremely rare lung disease. He's been on oxygen supply for the last two years and has also developed problems with his bones, blood, and skin. In response to my recent post on Facebook about the interview with Dr. Caldecott, he posted the following, quote, I remember when Helen Caldecott came to Port Hope. 
myself, contaminated with uranium, ill. I recall her stating that we have to stand up for and help people like this, as she referred to me. That was some years ago now. The story is still the same, but I have become much worse, deathly so. And in all those years since, I have also become more isolated, with less assistance, alone. Used well by many people, groups, hearings, news reports. Now looking back, I was nothing more than a flash in the pan, like so many others before me. We have the nuclear industry on one side, the resistance to nuclear on the other side, and somewhere in between are the victims of nuclear, the people that the industry denies even exist. The same people that all these groups and individuals that are anti-nuclear are fighting to not become the victims of exposure. Somehow, those that we expected to be with us, to help us, have gone a separate way, forgetting that we are the reason, the evidence to support this resistance to nuclear. We are all aware of the suffering in years gone by. That cannot be changed. But we must ask, what are we doing for today's victims? Somehow, we have misplaced the very people behind the reason that the nuclear industry must not continue. And this truth suits the nuclear industry just absolutely wonderfully. The last 20 years have shown no change in the industry attitude and even less for nuclear exposure victims. A change in direction, I believe, would be disruptive to the nuclear industry and beneficial to all. Dan Rudkin is awaiting a matching donor for a double lung transplant. He has a GoFundMe campaign for anyone who wishes to donate. It is at GoFundMe.com slash Dan Rudka, and his last name is spelled R-U-D-K-A. We'll have a link up on our website. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 3rd, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, NHK, TEPCO, WSJ.com, JapanTimes.com, DPA, NaturalNews.com, Mainichi.jp, Japan Atomic Energy Agency, UT San Diego, LegitGov.org, Greenpeace.org, BostonGlobe.com, CapeCodOnline.com, ArsTechnica.com, TheGuardian.com, FijiTimes.com, ShelterIslandReporter.TimesReview.com, MiningAwareness.WordPress.com, NationalUnityGovernment.com, De Un Renard of Rainbow Warriors for his crunching the numbers on Fukushima waste incineration, Myla Reason for her video of Mrs. Stanley Kramer, and the big-hearted Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts or just check us out on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Our YouTube channel carries the show courtesy the weekly support of Joni Ray. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. Just give us proper attribution and you've got it. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act 
is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.